Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Great to see you all here. Welcome to Rise City. My name is Pete. Uh, Pete Goodman. A little Bond joke, sorry. Uh, hey, it's great to have you. Ah, oh, some of you got it. Uh, if you missed last week, you're kind of wondering what this is all about. Robert kicked off a whole new series that uh, we're continuing today. And really, if you missed it, I'd encourage you to jump online and watch it. It was really awesome. He did a tremendous job setting up where we're going, what we're talking about. And also, let's just be honest, how many times in your life are you going to see a grown man preaching in a tuxedo t-shirt? Um, <laughs> So, which, if you know Robert, well, I know Robert, it made sense, because he's, he's the kind of guy who likes to keep it formal, but he also likes to party. So, he was ready to go. And I may or may not have told him that if he wore it, I would wear it today. <laughs> He'll believe anything. Uh, I said, oh, poor Robert. No, I, he wanted to do it. He was excited. Uh, but, hey, if you yeah, that's what happens when uh, Brandon goes on vacation. So, <laughs> here you go. But it really was, it was a fantastic way to kick things off. He did a really good job. And talking about this huge part about our lives as Christians, uh, the fact that God is on a mission, the fact that God has something he's doing, that he, he sees the broken state of our world. He sees the broken state of humans, of a world that he created good that isn't looking the way it's supposed to look. People are lost and they're far from him, not having a relationship with him and wanting to bring people back, to restore them, to bring back to relationship with him, to the kind of life he created them for, that he is on a mission, as we say around here a lot, to bring hope and healing to this world. And what Robert got into last week, and what this whole series is about, is the reality that not only is God on a mission to do that, but as followers of Jesus, who he's doing it through, he has called each and every one of the followers of Jesus to join him on this mission, this thing we call the Great Co-Mission. And Robert did just a really good job setting that up. The idea of co meaning with, that we are with him on this, that God is doing something in Jesus, and he's inviting the followers of Jesus to, to come along and share in it with him. We serve, and even as, as Bren just read a minute ago, ambassadors of Christ who have been reconciled to God in Jesus, now being called and invited to invite others to be reconciled to Jesus. Disciples who are making disciples. And we see this very specifically, this idea, this thing we call the Great Commission, appears in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus talks to his followers before he leaves. And he says this in Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. He says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. And kind of what we just want to do here is just playing off the whole mission theme. We're talking about how in every good secret agent, Mission Impossible kind of spy movie, that just like that, we too are agents, missions. We're, we're on a mission. We've been commissioned to go and do something, sent out with the task of telling others the good news of Jesus and helping them become disciples as well and inviting them into his kingdom, that we, with God, are the ones bringing hope and healing to his world. So this mission that all followers of Jesus have been invited on, and not just invited, you know, that sentence doesn't start with, hey, if you feel like it. <laughs> Jesus is like, you know, if you get around to it, he's like, hey, you my followers, here's the deal. Let's do this. And so we, I guess we, we have a choice, but as followers of Jesus, we are called to accept this mission. Today, though, where I want to kind of take this is it's one thing to hear the mission and, and get excited about it, and that's Robert's spiritual gift, getting people excited. Uh, but like, this is, man, this is, we're called to this, let's do this, let's go, Yeah. It's another thing to say, well, what does it actually look like? How, how do we actually do this? How does it play out? Knowing the objective of a mission, what I'm trying to accomplish, is only step one. Step two is, okay, now what's the plan? How are we going to put this together? And today what I want to do is I want to begin to break down the Great Commission a little bit. I want to begin to talk about what it looks like in practice. And this will be kind of a two-week thing. Robert's going to come back up next week and, and continue. But we don't just want to say, hey, we're on a mission, let's go. We also want to say, okay, so what does it look like in my life? Um, the how of making disciples. Uh, that's what we're going to focus on today and next week. So I'm just going to pray and invite the Lord to speak to us. And then we're going to dive in and, and ask the question of how do we make this a reality in our lives? Would you pray with me? Father, we're 
grateful to be with you. We're grateful to be invited with you. Uh, it's, it's one, it's freeing God to know that you didn't tell us to go do this on our own. You told us to follow you in it, to join you in it, and that's what we're doing. Um, but God, you've also put something big in front of us. You've put a, something that we're supposed to do that we can't just be lazy about and let go of and ignore. And so this morning, we're, we're here to listen to you, to what you have to say, to be challenged, to be moved, to grow, and to be the people who live out this thing you've called us to. Uh, to be hope and healing the way that you desire and see our world become what you want to be. So speak to us this morning, God. We're listening, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so as you kind of, again, I'm going to be looking back a lot last week as Robert talked about this whole, like, spy theme. Uh, when he and I sat down and talked about this summer series, Brandon is on vacation, now, it was kind of an idea of, like, we realized that we both love spy movies. Like, we have this in common. Uh, I, since I was a kid, I just, anything, whether it's James Bond, Jason Bourne, Mission Impossible, Get Smart, I love it all. Like, I, I love it all. What I found, though, when I was talking to Robert, and we've talked about this a couple times about other things, is Robert and I sometimes like the same movies, but for very different reasons. Robert loves just, like, action and, like, things getting destroyed, and he watches, like, the car shows, Fast and Furious stuff, and I'm just like... And we both love spy movies, but he loves, you know, James Bond driving a boat into a building and explode. I actually, my favorite thing is the, the plots, the, the intrigue, all the behind the stuff scenes. I love the secret plans, the back and forth between the hero and the villain. I mean, villains, you just, you gotta love a good Bond villain, right? And there's always some way too overly intricate plan they've concocted to take over the world, which... Side note, I'm still working on mine, and it'll be much simpler. You'll enjoy it when I'm your overlord. But ultimately, the special agent has to figure out how to stop him, how to, you know, thwart the plan. And it's, you know, as the viewer, you're always given a little bit of an overview. You kind of see what's going on. You've got the deranged lunatic with a half-deformed face and a pet monkey who's got a secret plan to kidnap the surviving members of NSYNC and jettison them into space. And your responsibility, you know, if you're up for it, should you choose to accept it, is you must save, you know, Justin Timberlake and the other ones, but really, we only care about him. Like, but you've got to save this national treasure. And, like, it's up to you, right? But, like I said, just being given a mission is just the first step. And what happens in these movies is they then play out. And you, you see that the agents actually have to say, okay, how are we going to do it? And they come up with a plan. In order to keep the greatest boy band of all time from floating off into space, we got to come up with a plan, people. we got to figure out how we're going to save them. And in a totally unrelated to sync way, a much more serious way, God has called us to a great mission. There really is something wrong with our world. There really is a problem that needs to be solved. And God really is calling us to join him in fixing it. So how will we do it? What does that mission look like in practice? So again, today, continue next week, I want to break down the assignment. I want to look a little bit more examination of what the Great Commission is, what it entails, and how we go about planning to succeed. And the way I want to do it today is, I want to look at three things that I think a good spy secret agent movie tells us about their plans. Three things that we can kind of say, a good, a, good, a good plan always considers these three things. And for us, as we talk about living out the Great Commission, I think they help give us some insight and some light about what it means to actually do this. <clears throat> the first is this. I think we can see in any great spy movie, any great, you know, James Bond or whatever, that once they get the mission, like this is your ultimate objective, you've got to break into this fortress and whatever, whatever. The accomplishment of the big thing is never just one step. It's never one small little decision they have to make. Uh, <laughs> that would be an extremely boring and short movie, right? Your job, should you choose to accept it, is log into Gmail and push this button. Click, now what? It's all done, thanks. What? <laughs> like, no, I mean, every, a big mission has a lot of smaller things that work up to it, right? First, they have to break in here, and then they got to steal the secret ID code, and you know, then they got to get a plan to take the security guard out. All these smaller things are leading to a bigger thing. And that's, that's true of a good spy movie, but it's definitely true of reality, right? 
Like anyone who does anything in that kind of field knows, like a real operation requires lots of small steps. And everything working towards a bigger goal. In the same way, I think we need to remember that our mission, the Great Commission, is not a one-step instantaneous thing. The mission is a process. This thing we call the Great Commission is not a, oh, we have a whiteboard and we're just going to check, check, done, check. It's, it's, it's a process. And I think part of the problem, the reason why this gets confusing for us is because we can kind of get confused when we talk about the Great Commission with what our actual goal is. What is the mission? What am I trying to accomplish? And if I forget what I'm actually trying to accomplish, then how I go about it can get confusing. And as Robert pointed out last week, this call, this mission, this assignment that we've been sent on is making disciples. God's plan to heal and restore his world and us as people. It's helping others discover the life that God has for them. So even if you, just, if you just keep that in mind, if the plan or the mission is helping somebody become something, we're talking about ultimately transformation here, right? We're talking about change. We're talking about growth. We're talking about somebody moving from this to something else. And that can't be an instantaneous thing. It is an instantaneous thing. Like when we talk about this word, even the word disciple itself, which is the whole thing is around this word disciple, we saw this a little last week. The word disciple in Greek literally just means learner, like pupil, student. It's a, a disciple is one who studies. And so when you would use this word, it was, it, you could also be like someone who might, you know, become an intern or, or take on a role wanting to become like somebody else. A disciple wanted to become like the one they were learning from. So Robert used the example of playing Simon Says. Simon Says this, you do it, right? A disciple would watch and learn and sit under and follow somebody else with the goal of wanting to become like them. So when we say we want to make disciples, we're not saying we're just wanting to, boom, done, disciple, (laughs) right? We want to actually help somebody become something. We're also not wanting them to become us. (laughs) The goal is not go into all the world and help people become like me. <laughs> you don't want to live in that world. Uh, when I'm running the world, you'll be happy, but not, when the, anyway. So like, the goal is for them to become like Jesus because Jesus is what human beings are called to look like. Our, our goal, our purpose, where we're heading is to become what God wants us to be and what God wants us to be is seen in Jesus. So when I become more like Jesus, I am becoming what God wants me to be. So here he's saying, okay, here's the plan. Here's the goal. Here's how we're going to fix this broken world. It's, it's amazing, but ultimately kind of simple. We are going to go out and we are going to call human beings to look at Jesus and become like him. Because when human beings become like Jesus, the world becomes a much better place. When you and I live like Jesus, our lives are better and the world around us is better. So the more we're living like Jesus, the more the world is becoming what it's called to be. And that is our mission, helping people become like Jesus. Making disciples is about helping other people in a process, a journey of choosing and following and becoming. And if you just look at the Great Commission itself, like this, this, the, the, the directive that he gives us, the process, is even in its own words, at least two things. First, he says there's the element of baptizing baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which is what you might think of as like preaching or ultimately maybe use a big church word, conversion. Baptism is the moment of decision. It's coming to that place of saying, I do believe this. We like to use the word wake up around here. Wake up. Wake, like, come to a place in your mind that you acknowledge, this is better. This is the life I want to live. I'm going to choose to follow Jesus. Coming to that place of making a decision. But that's only one step. Like, that isn't making a disciple. It's one of two parts. The second part is then teaching them to obey. Well, why is teaching them to obey part of it? Well, if the goal or the mission is you becoming like Jesus, how can I become like Jesus if I don't know what Jesus was like? Right? How can I emulate him? How can I grow to become like him if nobody tells me what he did or how he lived or what he was like? So the Great Commission is both helping people wake up to something Make sense of it. Like, yes, this makes sense. But then also begin to, here it comes, rise to life to something. 
to say, actually, now that you look to Jesus and you begin to live like him and do what he does, you begin to become the kind of person he wants you to be. So there's these two sides to it. There's a decision side, and then there's a growing side. These orders don't describe one-step activity. Boom, done, check. It definitely doesn't say the goal isn't just get someone to make a decision. And I think sometimes we make that mistake. We talk about the Great Commission using a a big church word, uh, evangelism, which comes from the word gospel or to to preach the gospel. Like, oh, the the, the Great Commission is evangelism. As if the whole point is just, I need to go out and tell people about Jesus. But again, think of the goal. What are we getting at here? The goal of the Great Commission is not for people to hear about Jesus. The goal of the Great Commission is for people to become like Jesus. So if we reduce it just to a message, just to a, hey, and ignore the rest of it, we miss where we're actually heading. So we can't just say like, oh, we're fulfilling the Great Commission. I told all these people about Jesus. Check, 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 check. Done, done, good, good, good. Here's how many baptisms we had. Done. No, it's a process of becoming. On the other hand, <laughs> if you've been around churches for a while, you know that it's almost common to use this word disciple. We add a little ending to it. We call it discipleship. Discipleship is like a noun in church. And we apply it to like our midweek services and small groups and classes. Discipleship is learning. It's teaching, right? But <laughs> we do discipleships on Wednesday nights which is like saying I have a Bible study. But look what Paul says in Romans 10, verses 14. He says this, how can they believe in the one they've heard if the one they've not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? If, if the Great Commission is just teaching, who are you teaching? Who is listening to you? Who, is, who are you helping become like Jesus? No one, if people who don't know about Jesus are hearing about Jesus. So it's both. The mission to make disciples is bigger than just evangelism, and it's bigger than just teaching. It's the whole thing. The Great Commission is this call to help other human beings in a process of becoming like Jesus. To grow, to become, to hear who he is, to make a decision, and then grow more into his image. It's not a one-time activity. And honestly, if you think about it, even that first part, the, the, the decision part, you all have your own story. Some of you are at different places along this. But I think if I were to ask, and I'm not going to, I would bet that a majority of people in this room, when you came to a moment of decision, when you said yes to follow Jesus, if you have, you couldn't turn around and say, oh, it was this one moment right here that someone said something to me. You'd probably say, oh, you know, it actually, for some of you, it was like two or three years of me really asking questions and searching. I talked to this person and this person. I listened to this. I had this experience. Oftentimes, the, just coming to a decision is a process for many people. It, it's not usually just, a, oh, I, I heard one time and I made a decision. That's, that's actually pretty rare. If that's your story, cool, but that's pretty rare. This is why one of our core values here at RISE is being journey-minded. You've probably seen that little slide pop up a lot. It's written different places. It's one of our four core values. Being journey-minded is just reminding ourselves that this is a process, that we are all in process, Becoming like Jesus is not instantaneous. Nobody comes out of the waters of baptism and is fully what they're supposed to be. We're all different places on it, right? And the mission to make disciples is also a journey. It's a journey that we take with other people. It's a journey that we invite people on and then we walk with them on. Helping them come to a decision and then learn more what it means to live it out. So it is a process and we need to be ready for that. It's not, it's, it's more of a crock pot than a microwave, right? It's, we got to be ready sometimes for this to be slow and long and in, in it for the long haul. The second thing is this, and it's just as important. I don't think any secret agent getting ready for a mission would ever think that when they get their assignment papers and they're ready to go do it, they wouldn't just turn around and say, well, a month ago we did this, so let's do the exact same thing they would know that every single mission is unique in its own way. The mission to break into this you know, volcano and turn off the nuclear weapons is going to require different steps than the mission to go and save NSYNC from being jettisoned to outer space. It's different. You need different things. And in the same way, we need to recognize that our mission is diverse. The Great Commission is a diverse commission because, very simple, the mission is 
people. The mission is people. The mission is not how big can our church building get, how many churches can we create. The mission is not, you know, how many TV shows can we get that say Jesus in them. Like, the, I mean, the mission is people. It's not how much money can we raise. All of those things are just different parts of a plan for people. And people are different. Do you guys know that? <laughs> people are different. We have different personalities. We have different traits. We have different backgrounds and experiences. We all come from different places. And while there are some tried and true methods, certain things that probably we always need to keep in mind, we need to be wary of thinking you can just do the same thing every time with every person. There's no one-size-fits-all plan to making disciples. What some people might need to make a decision and grow might be different from somebody else. And if you've been with us for a while, maybe you're newer, but for the last six months, we've been going through the book of Acts, uh, which has just told the story of the early church and how they got sent out and actually went and lived out this go into all the world. And what we saw through our study is again and again, there were all these different people. Not, it wasn't one character, many different people were going into the world and talking and, and talking to different kinds of people. And each time it was a different kind of conversation. For example, at the beginning, we saw the apostle Peter. He got up and he preached to the Jewish people. And he basically was saying, all of you Jews, listen, I want to tell you about the Messiah. They were deeply religious people. They believed in God. I think we have that slide, but they didn't accept Jesus as their Messiah. That's a very specific kind of person. That's a person who believed in God and was actually following God. The Jews were actually following God. They were deeply religious and devout. They just didn't quite understand how Jesus played into it. But then on the flip side, you had this guy, Philip, who met a, an Ethiopian eunuch on the road one day. That was a message we talked about a few months ago. And the Ethiopian eunuch wasn't a Jewish person, didn't really have any, Christian, any backgrounds, but he was reading the Bible. And he's like, I don't understand this. He's like, can you explain it to me? And Philip's like, yeah, this is what it means. Great, can I get baptized? Like you had a guy with almost not a lot of religious background, but who was seeking and wanted something, just wanted help. Then you had Paul himself, who would interact often with, with what we might call pagans. He would go into Greece and Asia Minor, all these different places where people uh, had no background of any kind of what we would call understanding of who God actually is. And Paul, Paul would actually have to talk to these people about an unknown God. Like, you, you don't know anything. Let me explain this unknown, completely, who is this guy, right? To people who don't know, probably don't care, don't see a use for it. Then we also saw Paul interact with philosophers and people who love to talk and, and engage intellectually. Different questions about the mind and things. And while some were open and interested, the eunuch was like, just explain it to me. Other people, you saw Paul give this impassioned, clear explanation of the gospel, and King Agrippa's response was basically, nah, no thanks. You're going to persuade me, right? Everybody's different. Think about how different that guy was from the Ethiopian eunuch. What he needs was so different than somebody else. Each of them needed something different. The Jewish people needed to be convinced that Jesus was the fulfillment of prophecy. So Peter and others had to show them in their own Bible, this is, look, it's right here. But if you're talking to pagan people, you don't show them the Bible. I don't give a, what is that book? I don't care about that book. It doesn't mean anything to me. It was a completely different message. They needed to know who God really was and why it mattered. And while this Ethiopian man, all he needed was just someone to explain it to him. He was wanting it. He was ready to go. Just tell me how to do it and I want to do it. I think many of the philosophers Paul met were probably like, eh, more like Agrippa. What is it? I don't know. A lot of them had like intellectual questions and hold on a second, uh, what about this? And you look at that and yeah, the time and the place has changed. That was 2,000 years ago, right? But really, people are people. Many today that you're gonna encounter are religious. Maybe they grew up in churches and they're kinda like, eh, right? They just don't quite understand who Jesus really is. Well, there's a lot of people, especially in America, more and more now that have no religious background. They're complete, it's completely alien to them. And they need someone to be like, this, this is real, this matters. Some people are out there are genuinely seeking in a place, just, I just want someone to explain it to me, I want this. And others are like, no, I don't want anything to do with that. And you have some that maybe they're open to talking about it, but they've just got some questions, like real deep philosophical questions. And you're like, uh-oh. <laughs> 
right? We're all in different places. People are in different places. There's no one size fits all when it comes to people. And that is really even just, that's just the baptizing part. That's just the helping them come to a decision. What happens after they make the decision? All of these people from different places then need different things afterwards. So if you could go back in time, and, and there's a lot to unpack here, but I'm not really getting into it. But if you were a Jewish person, accepting Jesus made a change in your life but not a massive change. You were already a deeply religious person. You were already committed to God. You already had a certain way of life that Jesus really affirmed. If you were a complete, you know, pagan, non-whatever, living in Rome, and you became a Christian, everything about you had to change. Everything that you thought was true and right and moral and good or not moral, everything got changed. In the book of Corinthians, we see this, like, really a, a big tension happening how you had to help some people grow to become like Jesus. What you had to teach them might be different than what you had to teach this person. Even today, when someone becomes a Christian who maybe they grew up in church, but they just kind of faded from it, it can be different than what they need than what someone who maybe is like, I didn't even step foot in church. What is this, right? And we all have, even forget about our backgrounds, we all have different things we struggle with. If the goal is me becoming like Jesus, and this is maybe kind of weird to think about. There are certain things about each of us that are probably harder than others to get over. You know, some of us, we become a Christian, we just got a lot of junk, we got a lot of stuff. I mean, others, you know, like myself, when I became a Christian, I just had a little ways to go. You know, I was almost perfect, but that's not true. <laughs> I'm always weirded out when no one laughs at that stuff. Does he believe that? No, like, we all have stuff we got, right? but they might be different. My background experiences might require me needing help to overcome this specific area. When you're like, no, I need help here. The point is, we're all different. And what you needed to make a decision, what you needed to get you to that point, and what you need to then grow and become the person God wants you to be might not look like somebody else. So the mission requires more than just one standardized, one-size-fits-all kind of approach, which may, for some of you, create a little bit of anxiety. I, I, I have some anxiety about it. You just start kind of thinking about some of that. You're like, okay, so it's a process, so it's going to take time. It's going to take a while. I got to be like fully committed, and everybody's different. Like everybody has, how, how do I do that? How on earth could I be expected to handle all of that? Which is a great question. And you're not alone in asking it. Um, I have asked that question. I have wrestled with that tension. And it brings me to my third thing that I think every good secret agent movie or spy knows. And it's true that, if we're honest, most of like the really good spy movies, like James Bond or whatever, you have sort of the leading man or woman who's just, you know, amazing. <laughs> and they're kind of doing all the really cool stuff. But honestly, even the most, what you might call like loner types, aren't doing things alone. One of my favorite things of James Bond movies is when he goes to, I think, is it Q he goes to? Where you get all the gadgets, you know, all the little trick things, the toy, gu whatever guns, and get the cool car with the machine guns in it. He's not making that stuff, right? He's certainly not fixing it, and he crashes like six cars a movie. Somebody's taking it and fixing it and putting it back together, right? Like he doesn't, somebody's giving him his orders, somebody's telling him where to go. He's always got contacts, He's never really alone. There's always someone in the van doing the computer stuff that you don't know what. Maybe some of you do. I never know. You got someone that, you know, is good at cracking safe. Someone else is good at putting on disguises. Maybe someone's good at, you know, languages or something. The ultimate point is the mission needs a team. The mission needs a team. And I think this is an area that we as a church can need to understand and embrace more for two reasons. One, I think to be most effective, we have to embrace this idea. Like, it, we will be more effective as a team. But also because it just kind of lets us exhale a little bit. The, the pressure, the anxiety of like, it's such a big mission, there's so much to accomplish. The whole world, everyone's different, it's a process, I can't do all of this. You're right. <laughs> you absolutely can't. Being part of God's mission does not mean you have to. You're not called to be James Bond and be amazing at everything. In fact, I would say this is an area that Hollywood kind of does us a disservice because we grew up watching these kind of movies 
and the way it portrays heroes can be very misleading to us. We grab some popcorn, we sit down, the movie starts, and for the next two hours, we, we watch as some guy with like a black belt in karate speaks nine languages. Suddenly you realize he has a PhD in molecular biology, and then he knows how to fly a helicopter backwards. You know, he, he can s recite 12th century French Renaissance poetry, like all, all simultaneously hacking into secret government computer mainframes. And he's ridiculously handsome. Come on! Like, no! What? Right? Guys, it's not real. No wonder we feel insecure and scared about our mission. We're comparing ourselves to someone who isn't real. No one should ever work alone. And no one's ever sent to work alone. In the real world, people that do stuff like that don't work alone. They have teams. And we need to stop letting a fictional character or a misrepresentation of what someone actually is scare us into thinking that we have nothing to give or no part to play. Because the truth is, here's what the great truth. God, in his infinite wisdom, decided, he chose to not make any of us individual superheroes. He did that on purpose. He could have. Do you know, like God could do anything. That means God could have made you with everything, right? But he didn't. He made you with deficiencies. And I don't mean like sin. I just mean there are things you're not good at. He, he created each of us with a need for other people. He created us to be better at a mission together than we are alone because it was his plan. And so none of us has everything we need to accomplish the mission. There are absolutely going to be parts that you can't do yourself. That's okay. Because here's the great news. The co-mission is both with God and it's with each other. This is not a mission you're called to by yourself. This is not a mission that you're called to have to do every part of it yourself. It's a process. You're not responsible for every part of the process. Right? It's, it's diverse. You're not responsible for every kind of person. You're just responsible to join the team and let us do it together. And we're in this as a team, which, which being a team makes us all stronger. We're more capable of doing the impossible when we do it together. And none of us, there's not a single person in this room that could connect with every other person, right? None of us have every experience that we can relate to everyone else's experiences. Your story, what God has done in your life, is going to connect with someone else that I could never connect with. The gifts that God has given you are gonna be able to be used to reach people and do things that I could never do. Even if I could, I wouldn't have the time to do it all. Like, we're in this together. This is why the Bible speaks of the church being a body. Some are hands, some are feet, some are mouths, some are ears. Like, we're all in this together. We're all working together to accomplish it. We're all gifted and equipped in different ways. But I think what, what often happens is like, we look at certain people and we sort of feel like, oh, that's like James Bond or something. I can't do that. And maybe the worst, if I'm just being honest, is like standing up here. Because I've, I've been like, I'm usually out there. Like, I know what it's like. You, you come to church and some person who has the gift of public speaking stands up here and talks about the Bible and how an expert Christian I am. And you're like, I could never be like that. Guys, the fact that I have the gift of public speaking doesn't make me a better Christian than anybody else. I, I have a part to play. God has called me to something. God has said, this is the role I've gifted you and called you to play in the mission with this team. But there are so many parts of this mission that I just suck at, like I'm not good at. And I could look at it and say, well, I can't do all that stuff, so I'm just gonna go sit home and not get involved. And a lot of us do that. Oh, I can't do what Pete or Brandon does. Don't. Do what you're called to do. You know, I see, I, I, said this first, I see all these like teal green t-shirts out here. And can I just say, God bless you. <laughs> I mean, if Pete Goodman was responsible for your children, <laughs> you, would, you, you would have left this church years ago. Like, it would not be good. But God has called you guys to play a different role than me. And together, we're doing something amazing. And if you look at one person's gift and say, well, I can't do that, who cares? You can do something else. You know, I, I, and I'll be honest, you know thing. One thing that I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at is if people have like deep philosophical questions or like, you know, why would God allow suffering or things like that? Like my brain 
has spent a lot of time thinking about that stuff. So I'm pretty good in conversations where people have deep philosophical questions. You want to paralyze me? Like, no, I shouldn't say this. Like, emotionally, <laughs> I don't handle, like, a lot of emotion well. I, it's part of my personality. I get very overwhelmed. Like, I am not a great person if you just need a hug. <laughs> But people need a hug sometimes. And that's why God created Robert Pedroza. Uh, <laughs> guys, I, I can laugh about it because it's okay. It's okay that I'm not good at everything. If I was, it'd be ridiculous. You're not good at everything. But together, if somebody calls the church and has an issue, I might, I might hear it and be like, you know what? <laughs> you need to talk to this person. Man, they, their story, you'd connect so well with them. I don't need to assume I have it all. I can, I, yeah. But there are other people like, you should talk to Pete. All right, let's talk. We all have different life stories, different experiences. Your story, what God did in your life is so powerful. And there are people who need to hear your story, not mine. Because my story won't do anything for them. But yours could change their life. You have a role to play. And we all have different ways of playing it. <laughs> Some of us are great at the baptized part. I, I said this kind of for service. Those of you know that my wife, Julie, I mean, my wife, Julie, whether, even if she wasn't a Christian, she would still be who she is. Like, people, people, people. And like, you put her in this thing of like, feeling like she needs to tell people. She just, she just goes, man. She's just amazing. She's gifted for it. On the other hand, I probably am better at the teaching part. I'm pretty introverted. You guys know that. Like, I, I'm not as good meeting strangers and starting conversations but when someone wants to learn, I'm like, oh, let me explain it to you. And the two of us are married, and it's cool, and we're a good team. But on a bigger scale, we're part of a bigger team where she has a role to play, and I have a role to play, and you have a role to play. We're working together. At the end of the day, you don't have to be a one-person hero. You can't be because the mission's too big. It's too diverse. It's too big of a process. Look at what Paul says he's, he, when he's writing to the church in Corinth. They were kind of dividing over which leader they liked better. Like, oh, that guy speaks good. I'm going to follow him. And I don't know, but I like this guy. And Paul's like, stop it. We're all just playing a role. He says, I, Paul says, I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. Like, we did different things, right? We both played a part in you becoming a Christian. I, planted, I kind of told you about it, and Apollos helped you grow. But God's the one that really made it grow. Neither the one who plants or the one who waters is anything, but only God makes things grow. It's a process. We all had a part to play in it. God's the one that grew it. So the one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. I love that line. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. But we're doing different things, aren't we? The person who digs up the ground and puts the seed there is doing something different than the guy that comes along and waters it or even reaps the harvest or even gets, like everyone's doing something different with one purpose. They'll each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we're all co-workers sharing in this mission. We are co-workers. Co-workers on a co-mission. We're in this together. It's a process with lots of different kinds of people. I just even think about like, as a, as a pastor, I kind of have this bird's eye view sometimes of life change, which is really cool. Seeing somebody who's completely far from God, hear about it, grow, make a decision, get baptized, then begin to learn and grow. And a few years later, you see them just, man, live in the life God has for them. You say, that's amazing. But then be able to step back and say, there were like 40 different people involved in their life. <laughs> they had a conversation here, and man, they talked to this person here, and this person helped them here. They connected with this person because they were doing this. And all the different ways we're working together, whether it's serving in kids or people going on middle school camps or literally just people greeting at the door so someone feels welcome when they come in and sit down and they're willing to listen to something that I or Brandon or Robert might have to say. And then they leave and they get involved in a life group and someone's leading that. They take their kids over here. They see a security guard. They know they're safe so they can relax and listen. Everyone is working together. And it does something amazing together. So you don't have to do everything. You just have to answer one question. How are you helping the team? How are you helping the team accomplish its mission? That's really the main question. Not how are you doing the entire process? How are you figuring out how to reach every kind of person that exists? It's just saying, what has God called me to do? What can I do today? Where can I serve? How can I get involved? How can he use my story? And maybe you'll be one of 10 people 
to talk to somebody before that person makes a decision. Who gets the credit? <laughs> Who cares? Is that the goal? It's all God growing it. But how cool is it to know that you played a part? And those of you that are serving, those of you that are giving your lives away, those of you that are coming here on Sundays or through the week or doing other things out in the community, you are part of a team that's doing a great work. And if you're sitting here this morning, you're like, I haven't really gotten involved yet. Man, today's the day. Get involved. God is calling you to get involved in the mission because it's a big mission and we need everybody serving. Amen. Would you stand with me? I'm going to pray for us and, uh, and just ask that God would continue to speak about ways he wants us to serve. And uh, as, maybe as you leave today, you can be thinking about that question. How are you serving the team? So God, we, we come to you this morning and we say thank you that you love us enough to invite us in. Even though it's scary, it can be sometimes give us anxiety, feeling like we have to do too much. But this morning we rest in the truth, God, that we don't have to do everything. We just have to do what you've called us to. So we ask for your spirit to reveal the areas that you are calling us to serve, the areas that we can give our time and our voice to, to help people on the process, the ways in which our story could reach somebody that needs to hear it. Open our eyes and ears to those opportunities, God. Let us be sensitive to the people who might need what we can offer. And let us not grow weary of doing good or <laughs> just getting lazy. Let's keep serving. We, we want to keep serving you, God, and join you on your mission because it's a great one and we're all in. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right. As we say every week, may we be a people who wake up, rise, and shine, right? Wake up to the Jesus who's calling us to that life, the baptized, make the decision, rise to life by learning everything he taught us and living it out and shining to others by going into the world and doing the same for them. Amen. Have a great Sunday, guys. We'll see you next week.